it is essential for our survival to use these powerful tools in the most humane and wise way. And the only way to guarantee that is not to shuffle the responsibility off to somebody else, but to make sure that every citizen understands science and technology to some extent. Lighten up, Francis. Francis. Good evening, everyone. It's Francis, your host of Collision Course, right here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com every Sunday from 8 to 10 p.m. You're going to join me for two hours of outer space talk. Right now is the beginning. It's 8 p.m. in New York City, March 15th, 2020. We hope you're doing great. We're going to have a great interview for the first hour, then some great outer space discussion for the second hour. So let's get going. Clear skies, everyone. This is Francis, your host of Collision Course, right here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Every Sunday from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern, you're going to join me, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's going on in our solar neighborhood. Not just that, though. We're on a mission to uncover and discover the truth about our place in the universe. Come listen to, for the interviews, like the one we're going to have tonight with Dr. Vincent Hugh, all about the Juno Space Mission. Come listen to me. Either way, we'll know more so we can decide what is real and what is not in the space outside our atmosphere. Every Sunday from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern right here on Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com. I'm going to look over into the chat room and say hello, everybody. Jimmy Jean, Greenheart, Cat Dog Girl, Mace 139, Canadian, Mr. Rowe. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, I have the chat room up on my secondary computer because I'm having a hard time signing in by my primary computer, so I'm going to be looking over my shoulder to see what's going on inside the chat room. We have my guest. He's going to be coming on right here in a minute here, but Switch to Stitch, which great show, boy Solomon, Pat Rabbit, Hop Hop, how are you? I uh, uh, hope everyone's doing good. Boy Solomon Naranya, N- Narayan. Uh, Mitchell, hope you're doing good. I hope everyone over on the Collision Course Facebook page, that's facebook.com for slash Collision Course 321. Uh, Richard Junkermeyer, uh, Jessica, Jaya, Jay-Z, everyone, uh, hopefully you're in your house listening to me right now for the next two hours of Collision Course. Let's go ahead and bring in uh, our guest, Dr. Vincent Hugh. Let's see if I can uh, bring him in. Add him to the call and begin our discussion uh, about the great uh, mission to Jupiter by Juno. Um, we did make a preliminary test call just a few minutes ago uh, to make sure that we could be connected together and that everything was going home, going well. Um, Skype is still um, pushing the call through. I hope everyone had a wonderful week. I know that... Um, here it was very busy i had uh, a couple of couple of um health issues that i had to go to the hospital for oh, here we go Hello. and uh hi dr hugh how are you very good what about you i'm doing fine uh as most times with radio it's perfect when we don't talk over each other because we avoid. Uh, like to say it could probably just be space weather I'm not sure what it is Dr. Q
You want me to try to call you again? Okay, one second. Now, you're perfect right now. So, hello, Dr. Hugh. You appear to be... Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's weird. It's sometimes it goes on and sometimes it stops. So. Well, I hope hopefully that for that few moments that it'll go away because you sound very good. Otherwise, it just went into the. <laughs> but you know, it, it's that's what that's what live uh, radio is all about. We have to take what we can get whenever it happens, and just you know, like I said, I throw it up. It's space weather. We were just getting hit with a, a bunch of extra gamma rays or something, and it messed up our communication. That's, that's all. That's probably what happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, perfect you know, uh, the virus and now the uh, the gamma ray burst, burst that we receive on the earth it's, uh, it's the end of time oh gosh that's a, that, that, we can get into that discussion at the end of our discussion our great discussion this evening that I have planned all about basically the mission to, to Jupiter by the spacecraft Juno because um, you and I first came into contact with each other on February 4th during the Lunar and Planetary Institute's uh, Space Exploration Institute for Educators. And you were there at that uh, representing um, yourself and a presentation about Juno and the mission to Jupiter, and you made a presentation to us. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And so, as usual, whenever we get a presentation, a very interesting presentation about something that has to do with outer space, there's a lot of information to try to take in. And so what I'd like to do um, for this show, my show, Collision Course, every Sunday for two hours, is we, we talk about outer space. And it could be a space mission, it could be space weather, it could be an asteroid, it could be a comet. And most of the time it has to do with whatever, you know, is currently going on in astronomy news. Now, what I find is really important about our topic tonight is that, in essence, not there is a lot of content, but not I don't believe not enough of it has been reaching the public ears. Do you feel that way? Regarding the mission Juno? Yeah, even in that, in particular, yes, this mission Juno and and its trip to Jupiter and and you know the the group of missions that it's a part of. I, I don't think the American and and, and worldwide uh, viewer has really had uh, ample opportunity to hear information about these missions. That's uh, yeah, for some of the results that are very that goes in great details about some specific aspect of Jupiter, it's true that it hasn't been publicized enough, in my opinion. But other results, like the beautiful pictures we got from the GenoCam instruments that we might be able to talk later about, uh, I think we, we've got some, there's some paper that have covered some of those, the most beautiful pictures we got. So um, well, that might be a, a hook for the public to then read more about Juno and some of the results, I have to say. Well, fortunately for us, um, I do have the whole presentation that you made for us at the Lunar and Planetary Institute, and I'm going to share that, of course, into the chat room. So listeners to the radio show that's not that are not on freedomslips.com inside the chat room, pop over to the chat room on freedomslips.com because I'm going to leave a link to the whole presentation that Dr. Vincent Hugh did for us at the Lunar and Planetary Institute Space Exploration uh, Institute. Now, I suppose what would be fair is let everyone know who Dr. Hugh is because – um, Dr. Vincent Hugh, and you can find uh, Dr. Vincent Hugh's information on vincenthugh.weebly.com. He's a research scientist at the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas. Now, anyone who knows me, my listeners should know, when I say the word Southwest words, Southwest Research Institute, I say, that play, I say those words with a lots of love. 
because we all should know through my past history is how much work is being done at the Southwest Research Institute when we're talking about missions in outer space and a lot of things, and we already know that. Uh, Dr. Vincent Hugh, though, uh, part of Southwest Research is to study the atmosphere of giant planets, mostly Jupiter and Saturn. Studying their atmospheres tells us how these planets interact with their local environment and how they respond to seasonal changes. Most of the research is done using ground-based and space-based platforms such as radio telescopes, ALMA, an IRAM-30M, or the Juno mission, which we're going to talk about tonight. And I'm not going to go any further. You can visit Dr. Vincent Hughes' website at Vincent Hugh, that's V-I-N-C-E-N-T-H-U-E dot Wheelie dot com, and I'll tell you more about it. Um, so working at the Southwest Research Institute, Dr. Hugh, you uh, work side by side with many, many scientists working on many, many different space missions, right? That's correct. We've been fortunate enough here at Collision Course to interview a couple of them, Dr. Okay. Dave McComas for the IBEX Space Mission and a couple of other ones. So uh, the folks over at Southwest Research Institute have always been, like yourself, very uh, gracious in offering up their time. So I want to tell, tell you, Dr. Hugh, thank you very much. And I want to tell the Southwest Research Institute, thank you for picking primo people to work with because... You'll, you'll find out, everyone, uh, when we talk to Vincent Hugh about Juno. So let's get into this mission, Juno, which is basically an orbiter that we sent to Ju- Ju- Jupiter, right? Can you give us an overview of the mission? So the mission Juno, I think, is um, sort of a follow-up after the Galileo mission, which was a probe that orbited Jupiter uh, from 98 to 2004 or 5. Um, and so not only it's going to try, it, it is designed to address some of the questions that were raised after the discovery made by the Galileo orbiter, but also increase more the knowledge of Jupiter magnetosphere, for instance, in different uh, just to summarize the mission, um, I think it was decided, it was um, selected by NASA around 2005. And from 2005 to 2011, the spacecraft was built, the instrument were uh, constructed, it was defined. Uh, and in August 5th, uh, 2011, the spacecraft was launched to Jupiter. And it took about five years to get to Jupiter. Uh, and we actually uh, inserted into a Jupiter orbit on July 4th, Independence Day uh, 2016. And from now on, from, from that point until now, we are still orbiting the planet on a very specific orbit, um, um, a polar orbit, which we are not orbiting like Galileo was doing in the equatorial plane of Jupiter. But this time we are actually orbiting from one pole to the other. Uh, and another specificity of the orbit, that's, uh, it's not a circular orbit. It's a very, very elliptical orbit. Uh, we go extremely close to the planet. Uh, the closest we get is about uh, 15 miles above the cloud top, which is, which is insane because we have access to incredible uh, details on the atmosphere of the planet. And then we go very far away from the planet. Uh, and that's every three and a half days. So like every month and a half, we have a very close flyby of the planet. Um, we take a lot of stuff, and from that, we uh, make science out of that. Okay, I think I'm going to stop for just one second, and I'm going to keep you going. Uh, just so that the listeners can understand that what we're talking about is an orbit around Jupiter that is extremely elliptical or egg-shaped, more than it is uh, circular in nature. And so this elliptical orbit at one point will bring the spacecraft Juno far away from the surface of Jupiter. And then it comes back in and zooms in very, very close in its elliptical orbit and to where the doctor said, well, uh, 50 miles or so above the cloud tops. Um, now, as we're making or as Juno is making, as we all together make this trip, this close pass by Jupiter, what are we looking at? 
you, and, well, tell us what we might be looking at and tell us what we're looking at it with. All right. So, so Gino has been designed to understand four main, well, to address four main big uh, problems. Uh, one of them being understanding the deep uh, water abundance into Jupiter allows us to better understand how the whole solar system formed. Because depending on the um, on the formation scenario uh, that led to the formation of Jupiter, um, depending on that scenario, you might have more or less. And this is a this is a very crucial measurement. Determining the water balance is important to understand how the whole solar system formed. So that's the first objective. The second one is to better understand the interior of Jupiter. Uh, by mapping, for instance, the gravitational and the magnetic field of Jupiter, which, which tells you in a way how like the matter is distributed inside Jupiter, as well as um, like how the magnetic field is generated on the planet or inside the planet. So that's number two. Number three is to better understand the atmosphere, because for the first time we're going to have access to uh, uh, unprecedented details on Jupiter because we go very close to the planet. And to better understand the planet, the atmosphere, we, we're going to map, we're actually mapping the temperature, the cloud opacity, the dynamics uh, to depth greater than about 100 bars um, below the, what we define the, the, well, the one bar level. And the last objective is to better understand the magnetosphere of Jupiter. Um, and with that, we actually um, build different science instruments to better measure particles, uh, different types of charged particles into the Jupiter magnetosphere, um, uh, to yeah, to, to uh, just better understand what's what are the charged particle population in Jupiter magnetosphere. And this charged particle population is very important for uh, several reasons, and one of them being that uh, they're actually coupled due to. Well, it's, they're actually um, leading to the brightest aurora on Jupiter, um, the brightest aurora in the solar system. Uh, so those particles, when they interact with the magnetic field, they actually uh, precipitate on the planet and generate very bright aurora. Um, and the second reason why the magnetosphere is important is because uh, in the future, we're planning to go actually look at uh, in more detail about the, the moon of Jupiter and to access the moon, those moons, you need to have a better understanding on like how dangerous the the charged particles are, uh, because if they're very energetic, energetic, um, they can be very uh, damaging for the uh, the science instrument or any spacecraft that would go there. So, better understanding the the charged particle population into Jupiter's magnetosphere is important also for future missions that NASA, ESA, uh, the European Space Agency are are going to lead in the future. I think it's a, a good point to stop and ask a question. Um, when yeah. when my listeners and even myself, I catch myself thinking about planets and moons and et cetera, et cetera, and I never, I do sometimes, but I catch myself occasionally not thinking about the environment of the place that I'm thinking about. So, listeners, if we're thinking about Jupiter and we have in our mind a picture of Jupiter, um, a mission like Juno is going to Jupiter to do more than take pretty pictures. It's going there to measure the environment around Jupiter, and i.e. the environment to which Jupiter creates through its magnetosphere, its, mm -hmm. inter its interaction with space weather, i.e. The, 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 the material and particles that come from the surface of the sun. And so part of Juno's mission is to determine these highly uh, radiation zones, uh, zones where there may be less radiation, the interactions between the moons and Jupiter itself, because this is a very, very turbulent and active area. This just isn't a walk in the park. Right, Doctor? Yes, uh, yeah, that's correct. That's a very uh, – That's uh, Jupiter has the strongest – planetary magnetic field in the, in the entire solar system and uh, and due to that strong magnetic field that is fueled by charged particles coming mostly from Io um, the, the charged particles are 
feeling the whole magnetosphere and are accelerated by the, the, the magnetic field, which makes this environment dangerous to go to. See, that was interesting when you just said that, that IO is, that IO is created. When you did, did I hear that? The IO, because I, I know of IO, or from what I know of IO, is its unique relationship that it has to its parent planet, Jupiter. We're talking about one of the tidal locked uh, uh, moons of Jupiter. Uh, I am also under the belief, I could be wrong, you could tell me I'm wrong, that this, this, this Io and Jupiter have a very strong electromagnetic connection uh, at the same time, almost like a direct current from, from the moon to the planet yeah. itself. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, that's, that's exactly that's right. Um, there is a coupling that is... Uh, happening not only with Io, but since Io is actually the closest to the planet, it seems that the interaction uh, between Jupiter's magnetic field and Io is the strongest. And from this interaction, you have a you have a, a stream of um, what we call the electromagnetic wave, the Alvin waves um, that, that are actually uh, created around Io and that are propagating all the way to Jupiter. Uh, northern and southern uh, magnetic pole, uh, and when those those uh, wave part, well, when those are actually the um, um, electromagnetic wave arrive around the the Jupiter uh, poles, they actually trigger some uh, particle acceleration, which leads to uh, an aurora on the planet. Uh, so in a way, there is a yeah, there is a magnetic connection. Uh, between a very strong magnetic connection between Jupiter's magnetic field and Io itself, um, and we call those uh, those um, well the the yeah how how can I explain that the the visible counterpart for this um, flux for this connection is actually called the the Io footprint. So there's plenty of pictures that were taken by the Hubble Space Telescope that actually um, is. That, that actually studied in great details, like the morphology of those uh, uh, footprints that we see on on Jupiter's both northern and southern pole. So it's an interesting topic. Very, very, very interesting, and we could we could continue to talk on that. But I just want to let all the listeners know right now: uh, FreedomSips dot com, Revolution Radio at FreedomSips dot com, the show Collision Course course with your host francis walsh and my guest dr vincent hugh from the southwest research institute we're playing on both studios right now so if you hear us on both studio a and studio b don't worry you're not mixed up you're in the right place you're listening to us both uh same show two different channels so that's great dr hugh thank you for joining us tonight to talk about juno now i'm just gonna shoot one question in there because we were talking about listeners uh a unique uh, direct connection between Io and Jupiter. How far? Uh, I don't know how to ask this question, Doctor Hugh. Have, have you spent any time researching um, how much uh, electromagnetism and electricity play a part in this whole thing we call the universe? And does it get enough credit for, for what it actually does in our university? Like we're talking about a connection between Io and Jupiter. Um, are there connections, intergalactic connections of electromagnetic uh, energy uh, driving the universe? Do you feel like there's an underreporting of the importance of electromagnetism in the universe? And that's a question that came from left field, but... Uh, it's a, it's a very wide question. Um, I feel like when you're in the Jupiter system, um, we are mostly dominated by Jupiter's magnetic field. In a way, the outside environment. Um, we even think that the, you know, like, um, like the the Earth's magnetosphere. We usually um, call it. We, we usually uh, refers to the well, we usually refer to the Earth magnetosphere as a solar driven magnetosphere, which means that it's mostly created by the uh, interaction between the charged particles from the coming from the sun and uh, the Earth's magnetosphere, the Earth magnetic field. For Jupiter, it's it's a little different because Jupiter is further out in the solar system, so it doesn't uh, the the solar wind influence is not as strong as it, as it is on the Earth. 
And in addition to that, Jupiter has a, a huge magnetic field. Uh, so if you, I mean, yeah, we, we call that, um, uh, well, in, in addition, uh, Jupiter is, rotates much faster than the Earth. And we generally refer to Jupiter's magnetic field as the um, as a rotation-driven magnetosphere because it's mostly Jupiter's rotation uh, with its magnetic field that actually creates this magnetosphere. Um, it's not... We're, we're starting to revise this with Juno, but uh, nothing has been, like, clearly established so far, so I'm not... Uh, I cannot extend much more on that. Okay, I think I might finally get to a question <laughs> because you know we I sent you some questions and yeah. I'm I'm terrible about that. Uh, what class of mission is the Juno space mission to Jupiter? And if you can, is there a, a class that's next or the next class of missions above Juno? Uh, but starting with Juno, what class of mission was that? So yeah, that's a good question. Um, so NASA generally defines different range of mission, class of mission, depending on how much money they want to put. So for certain class of mission, a budget, a cap, or a given class of mission. And um, Juno is actually uh, was uh, funded through the New Frontiers program, which makes Juno a New Frontiers mission. Um, and so the, the budget, the cap for a New Frontiers mission is uh, below $1 billion in a way. Um, and so there's New Frontiers mission that have been funded in the past. Uh, one of them was New Horizon that flew by Pluto, uh, I think it was uh, five, five years ago, almost five years ago, yeah, 2015. Um, uh, there is another one, Osiris Rex, uh, that is uh, that is actually uh, making measurements of different uh, uh, asteroids right now. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a class of mission called New Frontiers. Uh, to, and to answer your question, the next class uh, that would be really above would be a, a flagship mission. Uh, for instance, uh, Cassini was a flagship mission, um, which means that it's a mission that will cost much more than one billion dollar. Um, like Hubble was also a, a flag a mission. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope that is being built right now and uh, about to be launched uh, um, is also a flagship mission. Um, so, yeah. That's, uh, I'm going to go to my question list again. Um, I know uh, among space missions and missions to certain locations, they may take longer amounts of time or shorter amounts of time, depending on whether timing is important or not. Um, I know that through your presentation that it took five years for Juno to get to Jupiter. Was there any particular reason uh, that it took that long? Because in, under some other circumstances, it might not have taken that long, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's correct. Um, so the main difference uh, what, what's going to drive the, um, the duration, the, the, yeah, the duration to get to the, the point you want to get to is how you want to approach the, the body of interest. Uh, for Juno, we wanted to orbit, um, Jupiter. And so therefore to, to be able to orbit, Jupiter, you need to get captured in orbit around Jupiter. And so if you arrive with a, a tangent, or very fast tangential velocity compared to Jupiter, um, you, you're going to need to um, break to be captured into Ju Jupiter's orbit, which is going to be uh, difficult to do. It means you will have to carry much more fuel to be able to do that. Uh, and so to optimize the weight of the spacecraft, how much fuel you're going to carry, um, people uh, from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory have defined... Uh, a trajectory that would uh, make us do uh, one Earth flyby and then uh, go on the on the long tangential um, approach of Jupiter's orbit, uh, such that we would just have to do a, a small, a rather small burn uh, once we get there to be able to capture into orbit. And this is why the mission took uh, about five years to. Capture. 
Okay, um, I just left a link into the chat room of Revolution Radio at freedomsips.com, and it is uh, the article about NASA's Juno Navigators Enabled Jupiter Cyclone Discovery. Um, any input you can give to us, because it appears that part of Juno's mission is to look deep into the clouds of Jupiter and determine if there is uh, turbulence, convection, what is driving the wind speed, what is driving the different levels of atmosphere. So uh, it, it appears that we have a report back from the mission about how Juno navigators enabled Jupiter cyclone discovery. Can you tell us about that discovery? Um, can, can you repeat? Um, I'm not sure I understood exactly that. That's one. I'll start off. Jupiter's South Pole has a new cyclone. Okay. The discovery of the massive Jovian tempest occurred on November 3rd, 2019, during the most recent data gathering flyby of Jupiter by NASA's Juno spacecraft. It was the 22nd flyby during which the solar powered mm -hmm. spacecraft collected data. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I, yeah, I understood the question. Um, so, yeah, actually, we're discovering. We are discover, discovering every day new things about Jupiter, and there's things we cannot explain. By the end of the Galileo mission, there were still unanswered questions, uh, such as what controls the speed and width of the, the zonal jets that we see on Jupiter, uh, and why they're so stable in time. And there's still we, we still cannot answer those questions right now. Um, but going back to the uh, the cyclone, uh, well. You know, after a few periods, we actually discovered some uh, cyclonic formation to Jupiter, both north and south pole, that seemed stable over time. After on the well, on the time scale of few periods orbits, which which means like few months. Uh, but uh, on that particular periods that you're talking about, we actually discovered that another cyclone inserted into this uh, this formation of cyclones, a smaller one, um, which means that. Uh, the the Jupiter South and North Pole seems to be much well. We we saw that they were pretty dynamic, but it seems that to be um, even more dynamic than that we would uh, uh, we would have thought before going there. I mean, it's it's a it's a, it's a really um, yeah incredible discovery. Uh, there's uh, I cannot give any clear answer in like how this happened because. Uh, we're still trying to understand why such a stable uh, cyclonic formation can remain stable over time. There's still a lot of uncertainty in, in how those this this forms actually. Okay, so let me ask the question because I have that I have the article open and it's showing a feature image of these cyclones. It looks to be one, two, three, four, five, six maybe seven, and they're different colored. So the centers, some of them are darker colored, and then some of the others are much lighter colored. Do you know that picture that I'm talking about that I'm yeah, looking yeah, yeah. at? Yeah. Okay, so could you, because I know that there's a difference in between the ones that are darker, uh, the information that it's telling me over the ones that are much lighter in the center. What, what's the difference between the two types? Um, so they're, they're mostly all cyclones, um, and the difference is actually coming from the instrument that measured them. Um, it's an infrared camera that was built by the Italian Space Agency uh, called GERAM. It's the only, only uh, science instrument that was built outside of the U.S., actually, for, for the genome. Uh, and so what they measured is actually a um, uh, five-micron um, flux coming from the planet uh, and the bright regions. You fell away, Dr. Hugh. Everyone, you're listening to Collision Course here on FreedomSlips.com with your host, Francis Walsh, and his guest, Dr. Vincent Hugh from the Southwest Research Institute. Dr. Hugh is talking a little bit about a photo that we're looking at. I left the link into the chat room, and we're looking at some older cyclones. Um, but these cyclones have apparently held their shape, um, which makes them very unique. You know, we have different types of geometric 
uh, shapes and storms here on Juno uh, or, or as seen by Juno on Jupiter, as seen uh, by Cassini on Saturn. Um, we've sent a bunch of different missions to and past um, Jupiter. Dr. Huey here. Two or three in the call. And I'll go ahead and uh, see if we can add him and Vincent Hugh, Dr. Vincent Hugh, Vincent Hugh. Hello. Oh, there you are. Hello, Dr. Hugh. Yes, yeah, so yep. we were just we were just talking about the image of the different cyclones and how interesting it was. Now, let me ask the question. So this image of all these cyclones this is a stable storm system yes yeah that's correct uh it's it's tail rotating in block um like the whole the whole uh, strings of cyclones are actually rotating in in block uh, but over the different periods that we've been observing them they seem to be well stable uh, I say relatively because, uh, as you were pointing out, uh, in the, one of the most recent periods, we actually saw that another cyclone actually got inserted into this uh, this string of cyclones, in a way. Um, and you were also asking the difference in the colors, uh, which I was uh, answering before I I, um, I got cut. Uh, that's the bright yes. regions on the cyclone. They they actually uh, come in deeper and warmer uh, atmospheric layers, while the dark region, they come from a much cloudier and higher altitude regions uh, on those. Let me ask you, I'm not a meteorologist, <clears throat> nor do, do I have a history of understanding storms extremely well. But when I think about what's going on on Earth, if I wanted to think about an Earth cyclone, I would think like an Earth tornado. So sometimes Earth tornadoes are created by a horizontal wind that gets turned um, on its side, right? And now all of a sudden we have a tornado. So we have a horizontal wind that gets turned till it's straight perpendicular to the ground, and now you have a cyclone moving on its edge. It, do you see the formation of some of these cyclones um, as a result of that type of atmospheric Generator well, deeper. On, uh, I, I don't think we have enough detailed observation over a long amount of time to be able to understand the full generation process of those cyclones. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the law of physics are pretty much the same. That it's still it's, it's still a cyclone, so you still have. Um, um, yeah, you still have um, winds that are um, like a low pressure winds that are raising, uh, and due to the Coriolis effect, those winds are actually uh, spinning, and that's make that makes a, a cyclone. Um, we have the different latitudes of Ju Jupiter. Do they rotate at the same speed or at different speeds? Uh, so, is the equator spinning faster than a northern or southern latitude? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I don't think I have the answer right now. I'm sorry to disappoint okay. you, but I, I'm not working um, directly with the um, the atmospheric. Uh, the atmospheric um, research side. You did fall away, which is fine. So I'll just come on and I'll just talk over. And the reason why I asked the question really is I guess I'm looking at our sun because we have uh, different speeds of rotation depending on different latitudes. Um, Dr. Hugh, just come back on if you can break back in. It's not going to be a problem. We are at 8.40 p.m., 8.41 p.m. in New York City on March 15, 2020. You're listening to Francis Walsh, host of Collision Course. I'm speaking with my good friend, uh, friend, uh, Dr. Vincent Hughes, scientist from the Southwest Research Institute, very knowledgeable on the Juno space mission to Jupiter. 
Uh, if you know anything about uh, Collision Course, you know we love to spend two hours talking about outer space every week. It is the highlight of our week to bring to the public our free speech about outer space, honest reporting about what's going on. Um, and we bring the uh, principal investigators, the scientists, the professors, the department heads who can tell us what they what they feel is going on in the space outside our atmosphere. And we spent uh, tonight and are spending tonight talking about Jupiter. Dr. Hugh, are you here with us? And Dr. Hugh has just had one of those connections, and it's the way things go. You know, it's okay. Uh, Skype sometimes isn't the perfect connection. Um, I guess it's funny when they give us that little survey at the end of every call. We should just fill it out rather than exiting out and give them uh, the middle-of-the-road review because sometimes their calls, we can't hang on to it. Um, and this uh, and this explanation, though, ooh, you scroll down in that article and you can see all the different representations. You can see how big the United States is. It's, it's just about as big as that center cyclone. See Texas down there. That's the size of that other little cyclone down there. <coughs> And then they give us the hexagon. Excuse me one second. They show us where the hexagon is, and then they show us where the storm actually is. Data from Juno's Jovian infrared auroral map or gyram instrument indicates we went from a pentagon of cyclones surrounding one of the center, one at the center, to a hexagonal arrangement, said Alessandro Mura. Dr. Hugh, he said, I don't understand. This connection was generally good. I'm I'm not quite sure either, Dr. Hugh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hi, Dr. Hugh. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, we normally have good connections. It could be just something going on. Uh, could be a lot of people home talking on uh, talking on Skype tonight. Who knows what it could be? But uh, I hope you're okay. It'll be okay. Um, once you fall, once I know that you've fallen off, I, I normally keep talking. I was just talking uh, out of this paragraph here that data from jo- Juno's Jovian infrared auroral mapper, the Jiram instrument indicates they went from a pentagon of cyclones surrounding one at the center to a hexagonal arrangement, said Alessandra Mura, a Juno co-investigator at the National Institute for Astrophysics in Rome. This new addition is a smaller is smaller in stature than its six more established cyclonic brothers. It's about the size of Texas. That's the one I was talking about. Maybe a Jiram data from future flybys will show the cyclones growing to the same size as its neighbors. So we were still looking at that very interesting uh, setup of uh, cyclones. Um, I have one question from my list. I want to get back to it. Do you believe Jupiter was the solar system's first planet, Dr. Hugh? Uh, I think that's the current... Uh um, yeah, yeah, that's that's the current idea that is you know, because uh, Jupiter is actually the biggest planet. We think that it had it, it had to be formed first so that it could aggregate enough material to be to grow that size. Actually, so yeah, we think that's the first planet to have formed uh, the, the gaseous planet. We think the gas giant planet have formed first, and then came the the, the rocky planets later. I'm going to ask a sneaky question. Did Jupiter move away from the sun or in toward the sun? Uh, so there's it, it's a it's a good question. It's a complicated <laughs> Sorry. question. Sorry. Uh, no, no. Um, it's I'm I'm very happy to discuss about that. Uh, it's it's fascinating actually, and there is a couple of theory that are that think that Jupiter formed uh, out a little bit. Uh, Further out, and then migrated inward. Then once Saturn, uh, who also migrated inward, got sort of uh, in resonance with uh, with Jupiter, they both migrated outward. Uh, and that's one of the scenarios that scientists have been uh, putting in the literature in the past few years. Uh, it's a scenario called the Grand, the Grand Tack. Um, yes, and uh, the the migration those two huge planets have 
has had a huge influence in the in the entire solar system formation, especially the the low uh, the the smaller planets like uh, Earth, Mars, and um, and uh, also the population of asteroids that we can we can detect in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Well, for the listeners, the uh, the question did Jupiter start closer to the sun to move out or did it start further out and move in? It's still one of those unanswerable for a fact questions. We know that we have spoken with some scientists who believe that it's out coming in, but we also have spoken with a couple of scientists who said it could have been in and moved out. And if you look at the way some of our exoplanet solar systems are starting to uh, be described to us, we see that there are super giant uh, ga- gas giants in these new exosystems that are very close to their host star. And maybe in the future they'll tell us as we watch them get farther and farther away from their host star exactly maybe, maybe how Jupiter uh, acted at the beginning of our own solar system. I'm looking back through my list of questions. Mm-hmm. Question, how long can Juno keep going? Oh, no, actually, before we get there. <laughs> So, so uh, last year, y'all had a pickle. I'm, I'm just, I'm gonna just, uh, I, I, and I just read the information yesterday. I should have recognized it right away. There was a mission critical moment, kind of recently, with the Juno space mission, whereby Juno had to have its propulsion system used for 10.5 hours in order for it to get on the other side of Jupiter's shadow. Uh, if it did not do that burn, it may have perished on its way through the dark side uh, shadow of Jupiter. Is this correct? This is correct, right? So, yeah, the first part is correct. Uh, we had to do a maneuver to avoid Jupiter's shadow. And the way we, I mean, you have to to remember that Jupiter, uh, Juno is actually a solar-powered spacecraft, and it's the first time we have a solar-powered spacecraft uh, to the orbit of of Jupiter. And so this is uh, th- this was critical because as we were going into Jupiter's shadow, we would not have gotten as uh, well any sun at all to power the, the the spacecraft. And even though we have battery on board, it's a critical event because. If something happened and you discharge your battery and you don't have any more sunlight, well, the, the, you don't have any power of the spacecraft anymore. So it's, uh, um, yeah, it's it's important to always keep uh, the the spacecraft uh, um, with uh, with battery on and and power uh, the instruments. Otherwise, you're, yeah, you cannot talk anymore to the spacecraft. Uh, so the mission, the the maneuver was done successfully. Uh, we avoided the eclipse, and uh, we are good to go until the next one. <laughs> Let me ask you, um, which I didn't really bring up in listeners, it is very important. Uh, Juno was the first uh, mission to get to Jupiter on solar power. The solar power system generated about 500 megawatt, megawatts? 500 no, megawatts? No, no. what? 500. 500 watts. Yeah. <laughs> now that's that's how much I don't know everyone. 500 watts and that it was enough to get them out into their mission parameters out in Jupiter. But here's my question. So we have electric uh, spacecraft. What was our form of propulsion? What did we actually pro- propel ourselves with for the 10 and a half hours? Uh, uh chemical propulsion. Uh, yeah, we just have tanks that uh, was um uh um, the so standard, there's, some chemical, uh, there's some chemical gas. You still have some yeah. chemical propellants. Yeah, uh, what, what I'm saying by the solid power uh, mission is that we don't use radio isotope to generate electricity uh, for yeah for for the first time up to the for giant planets because the Voyager mission, the Cassini mission, all those missions were powered by radio isotope. Like yeah. And a radioisotope is radiation, basically, right? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, in a way, it's a mini nuclear rea- reactor that produces electricity uh, that you then to power the the spacecraft. 
Okay, we've got, uh, unfortunately, this was a fast hour, and we have to still get to Juno Cam, uh, Dr. Hugh. So we're yeah. going to spend the last five minutes on uh, Juno Cam. Tell us what Juno Cam is, and tell us what amateur astronomers can do to help. So, yeah, that's a very fascinating part of Juno. This is the first time we have a camera on Juno. Uh, well, on um, any spacecraft that actually is entirely devoted for public outreach. So it's, uh, it's a camera that uh, was designed to uh, to uh, engage the public. Uh, so if you go to, uh, you can actually, uh, all your listeners can actually participate in the mission through that instrument. All they have to do is to go to uh, mission.swri.edu. And they can um, they can log into the um, the JunoCam uh, 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 let's say uh, yeah the, the JunoCam uh, uh, yeah I'm, I'm losing my word but the, the portal the JunoCam portal yeah yeah that's that's it uh, where they can uh, help with planning for instance if any of your listener have a telescope um, and they took pictures of the Jupiter they actually uh, update the state of the atmosphere of Jupiter for planning purposes. Let's say there is a new storm that popped up in the in the region of Jupiter. The amateur can upload that and help uh, planning for the next uh, next vigil. So yeah, um, um, uh, GenoCam was actually a camera uh, that was put on the spacecraft to engage people and, and let them participate in the Juno mission. Um, I put the uh, I put the link into the chat room for Juno Cam, and you can go, everyone, and listen uh, listen and look at the information that they have there. And Juno Cam, like Dr. Hughes said, is a dedicated camera. And what someone like myself, or with the ability to use a telescope and take pictures and take observations and to be somewhat technical in your observations. So if you're going to go out and take a picture, know what time you took the picture at, know what it is you're interested in, have an idea of what you're going after. And if you submit uh, images into the Juno Cam database with the importance of what may be on that picture, you may one day find that the Juno Cam is going to point to that item that you found to be important. So let's look at this. Most of these images that Juno Cam is looking for is somewhere around the northern or southern poles. So if you're an observer of Jupiter and you're taking pictures of Jupiter and you've noticed that there's a new storm at the northern or southern latitudes, that'd be something you want to take a picture of. And then you take the picture and you go back over the Juno Cam information portal and you submit the information as asked. Now I've yet to do that, so I don't want to. I don't want to pretend like I've done it or that I know exactly how to tell you how to do it. But I do want to tell you that it is available to you to go and submit images that you took yourself to say there's a new storm here. Please go look. And if I can add some two things. Uh not only you can upload your your uh, planning images, you can also participate in the discussion about what will be observed by GenoCam at the next Perigeo. Uh, you can create points of interest on Jupiter. Let's say you have discovered a new uh, a new uh, a new storm on Jupiter, and you can raise oh there is a point there is a new storm right here. Um, and uh, depending on how interested it is, um, it's it's uh, people can vote, and depending on how much votes every point of interest got, uh, GenoCam will observe these points uh, at the next uh, the next orbit. Uh, and then you have also the imaging processing se- section, uh, where once the the picture, uh, all the raw images are put online. And people can, it's free. I mean, people can actually grab those raw images and process them the way they want um, using different filters or uh, assembling them. They want to, to, they want, uh, uh, yeah, the the way they want. Uh, And also um, uh, if they make, um, I mean, then they can actually um, um, submit those images that they've made. And if the, the mission, uh, the Juno project is actually using any of those images. Uh, the person who actually made it will is credited for the work they've been doing, which is which is pretty cool. I mean, it's a it's a very good way to engage people into this um, <clears throat> into this uh, this uh, nice mission. Doctor Hugh, comment Vincent. 
Uh, I thank you so much for joining me for this hour. Uh, as I always say, the hour goes by very, very quickly. It is uh, 8.56 p.m. in New York City. It's 7.56 p.m. here in Mission Control, Houston. Um, we had a great time talking about Juno, the space mission to Jupiter. I will, of course, contact you after the show, and I'll give you links to uh, all the things that you'll want to listen to after we're done with this show. I appreciate you so much for joining me, not only on Studio A, but also on Studio B during this hour, first hour of Collision Course right here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Dr. Vincent, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francis. I'll talk to you I'll talk I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Have a good Sunday. Thank you. If you could hang up from where you are, that that helps me because I don't want to hang up everybody. Okay, everyone, it is uh, 757 and the break is on. I'll be back. Vivisect, analyze, examine, study, scrutinize, and extract an essence of reality from a fog of illusion and confusion. You can find me on Studio B every Thursday at 1700 hours Pacific Time. That's 8 p.m. Eastern. No topic taboo, no subject too strange. I strive to take a neutral standpoint during the dissection of the topic at hand. That's Reality Extraction with Mr. Rowe on Revolution Radio. This is Thomas, a.k.a. a mad painter. I'd like you to join me Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Open Canvas. Don't forget to bring an open mind. Yes, folks, that's right. Bring an open mind to an open canvas. Again, that is Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern. You opposed to government corruption. This is Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Sending time and space, let us take you to the place inside your mind where thoughts divide and mysteries unwind. Join us every Monday evening right here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. And you will catch the Fenton Perspective with our great host, Lorian Fenton. Come listen in as she shares her amazing stories from the past to present, along with all of her guest secrets to the future. That's the Fenton Perspective every Monday evening right here from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, only on Revolution Radio. Oh, and uh, you don't need to expect us. We're already here. 